Afternoon, Council, and thanks for um, coming in early for our special Council meeting today. And for those of you watching online, welcome. Uh, I hope you uh, you enjoy uh, the presentations that are about to come forward. I can start by uh, asking if you have a cell phone or electronic device, and my computer uh, is put to silent. Um, public records made during this meeting are both audio and video recorded and shall form part of the record which will be obtained by the clerk's office and you can get more information about that from the clerk's office. So we'll open the meeting with the approval of the agenda. Is there a mover and a seconder to get that on the floor? Councillor Payne and Councillor Waters. Is there any amendments to the agenda? Seeing none, all in favour? I would ask if there's any disclosure of interest. Seeing none, if one becomes apparent to you, you know the rules. And next, we're happy to welcome Mr. Wally Malcolm, President and CEO of InServices, uh, InPower, and Enterprises. Welcome, Wally, and whenever you're ready. The companies that are wholly owned by the town of Innisfil, as promised during our orientation, we figured it was uh, best to do it on a quarterly basis to provide you an update as to where we are with the utilities and answer any questions that you may have quarter by quarter. So we'll start with uh, InPower Corporation first. Again, InPower has, uh, serves approximately 19,000 residents and businesses. We have over $80 million in infrastructure. We operate 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And the program is rate supported. There is no monies obtained by the tax roll for the town of Innisfil residents. As we noted, InPower's customer growth is continually rising. At the end of 2018, we had a four 5.4% increase in customer growth, and we're budgeting around 3.19% for 2019. There has been a slowdown in the activity in the town of Innisfil and South Barry, and that's captured in that budgeted amount for 2019. To give you the staffing of InPower on the first quarter, we employ 51 employees that consists of permanent full-time, part-time, temporary full-time, temporary part-time, as well as we have two folks on leave currently. Recruitment has been hot and heavy at Empower over the first quarter. As you can see by the list, these are the positions that have been vacated and that we're filling currently. So we had a financial analyst, stockkeeper, a supervisor, supply and chain operations, accounting supervisor, payroll administrator, uh, we've taken on a marketing communications co-op student. We have a power line technician co-op student, uh, two accounting clerks, as well as a power line technician that just recently left our organization to take up an exciting opportunity at Hydro One in the training area to help train future linemen of the future. With uh, all the staff that we do have, we do have a number of training programs. So in the first quarter, these are the training that we undertake, effective communication, forklift training, distribution generation technology and impact assessments, uh, the utility work protection code, uh, working at heights, our folks are up in the air 40 plus feet, so they have to have uh, continual training on working at heights. Uh, we deal with a lot of customers that have uh, stress in their lives and it uh, formulates as far as uh, getting a high bill. Uh, unable to pay a bill, so uh, our staff are dealing with uh, folks that uh, are under stress and we need to deal with that and understand how to respond to those folks. Uh, Centric Dynamics is a leadership training program and meeting Chapter 5 of our regulatory requirements as well. We always try to promote internal transfers within our organization, so we had a number of folks that uh, took up positions that are higher than what they are currently at. 
So they've met the requirements to go from their current position to a new position. So we had an accounting clerk go to a financial analyst position. We had a temporary contract individual go to our accounting supervisor position. We had another temporary contract go into our accounting clerk. And one of our accounting clerks went into the supply chain operations supervisor position. Joint health and safety is very important and it's integral to the safety of our organization as well as to the safety of our staff and to the public. So we do have a joint health and safety committee, three management representatives and three worker representatives, as you can see on the list. The last meeting was February 28th. We meet, in, meet on a quarterly basis. There was no health and safety issues identified at February 28th, 2019. This is a chart that we've shown you in the past to show you where each dollar heads uh, goes from our bill to various organizations. The one on the uh, right is how we invest our portion of the bill. After our uh, rate submission and approval from the Ontario Energy Board, uh, last year we were 32 cents for every dollar. Currently we're now 30 cents for every dollar. So we are seeing efficiency gains and we're starting to see the cost to the end user customer come down as well. Commodity charges, which is approximately 50% of the bill, it goes straightly back to the generation component. Starting May 1st, we enter into the summer hours, uh, so the time of use changes. So just want to make sure that folks understand that uh, we're moving from a winter time of use to a summer time of use, which changes the on-peak time. Uh, for the highest consumption price of the bill. The Ontario Energy Board said with the change moving from winter to summer, uh, the only component of the on-peak rates will be changing to 13.4 cents per kilowatt hour. The other two rates are staying the same as per the Ontario Energy Board. Again, we have this bill calculator on our website for customers to go in enter their consumption and they can see what the difference is in regards to making changes in their lifestyle to ensure that they can reduce their part of the bill. And the majority of the bill, again, is the electricity of the commodity part. So with the time of use changing, rechanging and rethinking how you use your electricity during the day will help save money in the long run. We really pride ourselves on customer engagement with Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Over the first quarter, we've seen a, an increase in all three areas, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Customers' feedback in regards to us notifying them about outages, anything that's happening at Empower has been greatly received. We, we're getting a lot of retweets back out to the community. Uh, the Instagram is new for us, and it's, we're pleased to see that the uptake on the Instagram is going very well. Part of our customer engagement was to move to paperless bills. So we ha held a, an opportunity for the residents of Innisville to sign up for paperless bill and we would contribute to the Rosardo Health Hub here in Innisville. I'm pleased to report that during the campaign, 233 customers did switch to paperless bill, which amounted to a contribution of $1,165 to the Rosardo Health Center. In customer satisfaction, we take note of each quarter of the number of telephone calls we see, how many walk-in traffic we see. And as you can see over the course of the time, where telephone calls average around 5,000, our walk-in traffic is around 12 to 1,300. Uh, the billing accuracy, so it's a quarterly average, is around 99.89%, which is exceptional. And the log calls that we have that relates to moves, payments, arrangements, and billing amounts to the majority of the calls that we received, and it was around 8,000 calls. This just gives you a visual as to the number of calls. This represents 80% of the log calls that we received in Q1. So a lot uh, dealing with a variety of uh, what's happening with the moratorium on disconnection of power. We were very proactive during the moratorium to at least advise the customers of their options, to let them know that uh, we're here if there's any payment arrangements that they would like to make with us to ensure that when the moratorium is over that they're not ending up with a huge bill at the end. 
that is even more cumbersome for them to pay. So we had a lot of, uh, a lot of folks in, in the town take us up on that offer and set up payment arrangements so that we could spread it out over the course of the winter for them. Some of the key accomplishments on the metering side, we have a, every household, every business has a meter. The first phase is a re-verification of meters. What this means is that we go out, sample our meters, and if they prove to be within the guidelines, then they can be extended for eight additional years. And that's what happened uh, this past quarter is that we verified the meters, we extending the use of these meters for another eight additional years, which means that we don't have to spend additional monies to replace those 10,000 meters. Uh, so this is a good news story that we can extend the meters and the meters are accurate for the customer. We went through an information technology audit. We do this on a regular basis to ensure that our networks are secure. It's been lots of information and lots of folks uh, hit up with uh, cyber crime. This audit will assist us and make sure that uh, we are tight and that we're not susceptible to those types of intrusions from the outside. Reliability, this is one area that uh, over the past number of years has been a great concern for our customers. Lots of flickering power, lots of outages happening. In power, we, we embarked on uh, a major vegetation management program. A lot of our outages are dealt with uh, ice storms, wind storms, and in particular, it impacts the trees that are overhanging our lines. So by going on an aggressive uh, vegetation management schedule, trimming back these tree branches, it has reduced the number of outages that we're seeing in the town of Innisfil. And you can see that from quarter to quarter, we're seeing about 58 to 88% reduction in the outages that we've seen at NPower. Uh, over the uh, past quarter in uh, 2019 compared to 2018, the consumption has actually gone down a bit. Uh, so it's tendency to be weather dependent. So if it's hotter or colder in the winter time or in the summertime, will depend on how much heating is being used in the winter and how much cooling is in the summer. So what we've noticed is a reduction in the kilowatt hours, but the peak demand has actually gone up by 4%. And when we're designing our system, we look at the peak demand. That's the most important criteria to us because it changes, the consumption is variable, but the peak demand tells us what uh, is our actual requirement for our utility. Our line and poll statistics, so we are increasing. So as the growth of the community happens, more poles, more underground cables are coming online. And this shows uh, how much we've done over the past year. Some of the key accomplishments in the engineering, uh, more customer focus, discussing a lot of the projects and providing calls to customers when we're in the area doing construction to make sure that they understand what is the project that we're working on, why we're doing it, and to get any feedback from the customer. In regards to the development community, meeting regularly with the development community to make sure that we understand their needs and requirements, as well as the date of connections. Operations, again, the Structured Vegetation Management System plan, and it's showing uh, the results that we've seen over the past year. Wanted to give you an indication of the major projects that are underway in 2019. Highway 89 and 400, that's to accommodate uh, the MTO, that's uh, complete. And that was a time frame that is set out by the MTO so that they can start their works. And we're pleased to report that uh, we completed that on time. The other projects are in either construction stage or design phases. And there's various subdivisions and intersections that we're working on that's continually happening. Process improvements looking at uh, planned, unplanned, after hour outages, how the job flow, uh, looking at fuel reconciliation, capital design, and looking at disconnects and reconnects when we're dealing with our customers. We're also introducing uh, Profix, expanding the use of that software as well as our accounts payable workflow to ensure that any manual interaction that we do with any of our invoices that they're being handled once and put into the system and it's accessed by everyone in the utility. Operating and maintenance administration. These are the actuals that we had for 2018. The revenues, again, the majority comes from electricity sales. 
actual capital program, uh, general plan system access and system renewal are the major components of our actual capital program year in, year out. Sources of uh, how do we fund these capitals, uh, contributions from others, capital contributions and borrowings. From this graph here, you could see that the distribution revenue trend is increasing. So as we're adding on more customers, adding on more plant, our revenue is increasing as well. And that's what I had for InPower. I'll take any questions now if anybody has any. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Malcolm. Questions or comments on our hydro company? Council Arsati. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you um, very much for the uh, presentation on that. Just a couple questions. Um, the uh, reliability, uh, the continue, are you, um, the removal of the vegetation program, is that an ongoing one? Is that based on a uh, call basis? Through the mayor, great question. It's based on taking our area, dividing it up into what is the, cre uh, the tree specimen, how fast does it grow, dividing our boundaries into certain quadrants to make sure that we deal with the tree species when they're gonna be impacting our line. So it's an ongoing process that gets uh, renewed as we continue through the process. So some trees grow faster than others, but if we handle and we know what the tree species are, we can uh, mm -hmm. be proactive, get in there before it gets into an issue with our lines, and that will help us in the future. Um, just a couple of follow up, thank you. Um, so residents have said, can they call in to have uh, in power look at this dead tree on their line that's overhanging lines, they can do that? Through the mayor, absolutely. We encourage okay. our customers to call us if they see something that uh, looks uh, out of place that may cause an issue for our system. Uh, we truly appreciate the call from the customer so that we can be proactive when our staff are out in the area to take a look at that situation and correct it. Okay, and then another question on the, um, you said the projected, in the, in the article, it's projected peak uh, demand is gonna be higher in 2019. 2018 was at 5.4%, uh, 2019 you have 3.19%. Is that just projected on growth? That's correct. Okay, thank you. And. Um, Hewitt Creek area, that's the annex land uh, for servicing. Uh, is that, um, uh, you're working on that with the developers? Yes, currently we, uh, we were meeting with the development community in Barrie on a monthly basis. Uh, unfortunately, the project manager that was overseeing that project passed away. Uh, so they were looking for a new project manager to assist them in the process. Uh, they hired a new individual on. We met with them initially, and we're going to be starting back up with our monthly meetings again. Uh, we have the individual. We met with them to get them up to speed as to where we're at. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions? Seeing none, uh, I just wanted to quickly say that uh, I would concur with the uh, the good response that I hear on the ground from uh, people, residents who uh, like to be kept up to date with the social media um, posts, particularly during an outage. And I think what's extremely helpful is the, the visual. So you know your lights are out, you know you can't cook your dinner, but when you go on Twitter and you see that there's a, a, a tree on a power line somewhere and that there's people there working on it, I think that gives people that, that sense that, okay, they're, they know that it's, that it's happening and they're doing something about it. And I've had really great um, response and feedback about those posts, so please keep it up. Thank you very much. Thank you. So next, uh, we're moving on to the in-services portion. So again, Mr. Malcolm. So similar to budget presentation, a lot of these slides have not changed since we just completed the budget process, but just to give you an overview again, close to 12,000 customers, 255 million in infrastructure, similar to InPower, 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year, and similar to InPower, there's no reliance on the property tax base, it's all funded through our rates. Staffing level at uh, InServices is 
28, consisting of 25 permanent and three temporary, which are our co-op students. Staffing at uh, In Services has undergone uh, some changes as well. Through the budget process, a number of positions were created, as well as some positions were vacated as people left uh, the organization to pursue other opportunities. So right now we're in recruitment of a manager of risk, safety and compliance, an administrator in the operations and service delivery. We're looking for a utility infrastructure technologist, a utilities operator in the water division, an instrumentation technician, as well as an associate engineer. Again, extensive training is required to run a water and wastewater utility. So a number of the training for the supervisory staff has been uh, leadership training. Uh, we've done uh, manage the mentor license so that we can encourage our management team to take these opportunities to gain insights on how to lead an organization, as well as first aid and CPR is a requirement for our work. On the operations side, there's a number of uh, processes, safe drinking water operator essentials, lab skills, a number of those that ensure that our staff are up to date in regards to the regulatory requirements in maintaining our water distribution system. Now we're introducing a new program in 2019. It's a new onboarding system for employee orientation and also looking at a mentorship program, an ambassador program for new employees to be paired up with a mentor to help them with any questions that they may have when they start to add in services. It's uh, an initiative that uh, we greatly relied on the town of Innisfil's uh, people and talent team. Uh, they assisted us in preparing this and we're grateful for the work that they did on this program. Number of policy updates that we're looking at in Q1. We've completed our health and safety policy. Our drinking water quality management system policy is complete, as well as our investment policy. We're working on our code of conduct, uh, respectful workplace, substance abuse, purchasing procedures, and active lifestyle. It's part of the one town, one team model. The Town of Innisfil and In Services, these are the shared services that we have with the Town of Innisfil. So we have some financial services that are based on the development charges that are received. Uh, we utilize the Town's purchasing. We utilize the Town's people and talent. We utilize the Town's information and technology services. Customer service, so any general inquiries that customers have can either call in to the Town or call into Empower. We utilize legal and clerk services here at the town, development engineering services at the town, communication services at the town, as well as the operations in regards to our fleet maintenance and our ground maintenance. So these are the areas that we utilize to help reduce costs on our part in order to reduce our rates to our customers at the end of the day. We also have uh, services between Empower. So Empower does our billing and collection we also handle our payroll services, customer service in regards to water billings. We utilize communication services through our SCADA system. We also assist with the public relations and we provide financial services to in services as well. Health and safety, again, monthly health and safety checks are completed at each facility. Fire extinguishers are checked. Our lockout and tagout binders are made sure that they're at every site and that the staff are aware of the location as well as the requirements. First aid kits are installed at all our facilities. Uh, lifting equipment is inspected to ensure that there's no issues with anybody attaching to that. We have an inspection by the fire prevention officer coming up. We also have uh, procedures in regards to our lockout and tagout binder and no trespassing signs need to be installed at all our facilities. So we're, we've ordered the signs and once they come in, we'll get them up and at our facilities. Same as the wastewater, same sort of idea. We need a new eye wash in the garage. So in case someone gets uh, an item, a chemical in their eyes, they can wash it out. So we have to replace that. Our fire control panel is due. So we're ordered a new board so that we make sure that fire prevention is kept up to date. 
And we also had some ice buildup that we're dealing with right now in, to ensure that the foundation is being taken care of so that we don't have any more ice buildup in the winter time. Some of the operational items that we do, weekly flushing, uh, recirculation systems, uh, hydrant maintenance, this is all to ensure the safe drinking water and make sure that chlorine levels are up and that the asset is being maintained. Social media is new to in-services, so we are piggybacking off of what the town of Innisfil is doing in their communications as well as in power. And we're do slowly developing our social media on in-services to provide the same level of service that they see, not only at the town of Innisfil, but at in power as well. Customer inquiries, uh, a lot of the inquiries that come in through to the town of Innisfil, uh, a lot of them are resolved within seven days. The ones that are 30 days old, those are typically winter construction that we're doing. We typically have to wait till the snow is gone from the ground, the frost is out, and then we can go in there and do concrete and pavement repair. So we keep it as an active item, but that's the reason why you see some of them lasting more than 30 days. Uh, th these are the calls that come into Empower in regards to uh, inquiries on in services, and the majority of them are high bill complaints, uh, is the meter operating properly? So we attend those issues, we get the information, we go out, meet with the customer and then ensure that the meter is reading accurately or if there's any other concerns that they have at the time, maybe high consumption, we'll address that with the customer at that point in time. This graph here is to show you the connections per operator. So this is the number looking at our neighbors and showing that uh, at in services, we are a lean operating utility. Uh, we have uh, a lot of connections per utility operator, and this is a, a good thing that shows that we are maintaining the system, and we do have uh, a lot of connections that we have to maintain, but uh, we're proud of the fact that we are keeping up with the regulatory requirements, even though we have more than our neighbors um, to east, west, and south of us. The number of customers, uh, folks may be interested in uh, what our neighbors, uh, what they service. So Bradford uh, Water Services is 9,000. It's uh, unique to point out that we do supply Bradford with water. So we are supplying not only our customers, but 9,000 uh, customers at Bradford. New Tecumseh has uh, 10,000 water customers. Barry has 44,000. Really is at 10. And here at In Services, we're at 10.7. Uh, beyond the Ontario One Call locate system, uh, there has been a decrease over the first quarter, but that's attributed to winter time. Not too many folks are out there building in the winter time. Uh, but the one thing that is unique in our area is that uh, the top one shows the provincial, the one shows the, the sector, which is municipalities. Uh, the bottom one is us. Uh, so you can see that uh, over 17% drop in locates over the quarter. Uh, compared to the provincial and our sector, we are a lot higher, so it shows that there has been a slowdown in growth in our area, and the number of requests for locates has actually decreased in Innisfil. Conservation programs, we have a toilet replacement program and a rain barrel program. It's been operating for a number of years, and what we're starting to see is that the, I think we've hit the saturation of those two programs. Uh, there are still people uh, utilizing the toilet replacement program, but not as much as in previous years. And the rain barrel program has also dropped off significantly. So those that were interested in using rain barrels to help with uh, summertime water conservation, uh, we're starting to see that saturation point. Uh, so the challenge will be to us to go out to the community and see what other things that are of our interest to our customers in order to help save and conserve water. Uh, fulfilling the ministry's requirements, uh, we're still above 85% on the majority of our inspection scores, which is still great. Uh, some of the drop-offs that we've seen has been reporting issues, so an operator would cross something out inappropriately, so you're not supposed to use whiteout, you're supposed to cross your line, put in the number, and then initial it. Uh, we had a number of those uh, that uh, were it was not initialed or wasn't crossed out properly according to what the ministry is looking for. Uh, so we've done some additional training with our staff to make sure that they understand their requirements under the Act. 
in regards to any changes on the inspections. Uh, the key accomplishments, we went over the uh, number of awards and public education that we did at budget time. Customer growth still uh, happening on a linear basis. We haven't seen the hockey stick yet. Uh, the program actuals is similar to what you've seen at budget time. Uh, the revenues are exactly the same. Uh, the trending that we're seeing is in an upward manner for both water revenues and wastewater revenues. Uh, the actual capital program, so the water is 32.9 million, the wastewater is 25.1, and our engineering IT and fleet amounts to 491,000 of our actual capital spend in 2018. Again, the majority of our funding sources come from development charges. Some of the key uh, accomplishments on the finance side is the chart of accounts redesign. We're utilizing the accounting software that we have at Empower to ensure that it reduces our general ledger complexity and increases the accuracy and the financial reporting from staff member to staff member. Uh, the capital projects, we went over that during budget time. So again, completion of the Lakeshore Water Treatment Plant, as well as the list deck at the wastewater treatment plant. The modernizations, uh, the Lakeshore Water Treatment Plant, we went to a membrane plant as opposed to the conventional plant that, uh, that we had in the past, which helps with our efficiency from 85% to 99%. And it also reduces the backwashing that we need to do, which then flows to our wastewater treatment facility. The water treatment and supply accounts for $38 million in the next 10-year uh, cycle. And the wastewater is $137 million that we're looking at uh, funding for our capital program. So the summary of our major capital projects that we identified during the budget time is noted again and the projects that we'll be awarding in 2019. Uh, the one that uh, is coming up due is the IBR in Young Street. Uh, they're starting, the County of Simcoe is starting their works, and we have some work to do at the intersection as well. Board governance. Uh, at the orientation on January 30th, I presented the board governance. You received a package in regards to Setting up uh, the board of directors, uh, we were on an interim basis right now. We want to move to a permanent basis. Uh, we asked for comments back by the end of February. We received a few comments of all in support of the document that was placed in front of you. So what we were looking at at today's meeting was to officially approve that uh, board governance document, as well as setting up for the recruitment of new board members on that uh, company as well. So in the board governance, it was set up for a minimum of five board of directors up to a maximum seven. Of the five to seven, two are municipal representatives. So the mayor is on the board of directors, as well as the chief administrative officer from the town is on the board of directors. So what we are looking for is approval of the board governance document that you received, as well as the number of board directors that you would like to see on this board. And uh, the minimum requirement is five. And uh, given the size of the organization and where we're at, that would be staff's recommendation is to look at five, but you do have the option to go up to seven members. What happens with the other three to four, uh, five would be independent directors outside of the municipality, so we gain insights and get uh, uh, power from the outside business world, so uh, blue chip type individuals to help us with the governance of in-services. Thank you very much, Mr. Malcolm. Questions about water and wastewater services? Councillor Fowler. Um, under one of your screen, uh, shots, you said here, I believe it was, that uh, in power and in services share uh, services together. Is it two separate people that correlate the information or is it one person that handles both companies? <laughs> It was uh, under the shared services, financial services, yes. Yeah, let's get it up here. So the services is from uh, InPower providing it to InServices, similar to the town of Venezuela providing services to InServices. 
So the financial services, we do have a dedicated staff member that works on in-services items from InPower. There are in the accounts uh, clerk position, there's dual roles where part of the time is spent on InPower, part of the time is spent on in-services. So it uh, provides efficiencies in regards to having one individual handling both companies. But when it comes to the capital program and the accounts payable because of the level of uh, requirement in one of the companies, there's a dedicated individual for that. So <clears throat> when they handle both companies, the dual role position, as you state, uh, who is the, it's actually, sorry, it is actually InPower that provides that service for, InPower in provides it for in-service and it's on their payroll. Yes, so it's InPower and then we build back to in-services for the time requirement for in power staff to do the work for in services. Other questions or comments? Councillor Ices. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yeah, Mr. Belcom, I'm just wondering again about the uh, the Listec product that uh, the uh, sewage plant will be uh, creating. Um, wondering if uh, Innisfil farmers will have the opportunity to to use that in the near future and, and what the uh, what that might look like as far as uh, being able to purchase that. Through the mayor, great question. As we uh, develop that program, we'll definitely uh, come back to council to advise what are the options available to uh, the local farmers. Uh, we're I'm dealing with an individual locally that has done some patented work in regards to uh, nitrogen injection and looking at a variety of different opportunities. Uh, so we're gonna meet with that individual and see, based on his patents and the work that he's done, is there an option to utilize this as part of the Listec uh, result that we're seeing right now. So uh, it's a work in progress, but uh, as soon as we get all everything aligned, we'll make sure that we'll uh, touch base with uh, council as well as to the local farming community. Thank you. Perhaps that would be a, a good presentation to make to the Agricultural Advisory Committee when it when it's set up. Other questions? Councillor Setti. Thank you. Through you, Your Worship, Mr. Malcolm again. On the uh, toilet replacement program, I know before that it was, um, I'm just wondering if it's now available for those residents that are on septic systems. It hasn't been in the past, but we could obviously take a look at that and see if there's an opportunity to expand the program. Yeah, I know that it was um, because there's still many streets that are on the septic and it's still the water going in. Excuse me, I'm dealing with the cold here. Still the water going in, even though, you know, we don't have the out uh, charges to the town, but I think anything we can to conserve would be good. And I'm also wondering about public education. I saw in the uh, news lately, uh, I can't remember what municipality, uh, uh, starting an education program for the residents on um, flushable wipes. Uh, the misconception that residents think they decompose. Yes, you can flush them, but they don't decompose. They, and this example, this one municipality, they had a flushable wipe in a jar, and I think it was something like 14 years old, and it still had not decomposed. So we need to get the education out there because it, it it's costly repairs, and not only for the resident, but for the town. And uh, Yeah, through the mayor, we uh, sent out a brochure on that exact uh, flushable wipes. We actually had a picture of one of our staff members holding it up at our wastewater treatment facility saying, this is uh, disposable wipes and this is what it happens at our plants, it clogs it up. So we have uh, endeavored into a campaign in regards to flushable wipes. Okay. And then also I just um, wanna compliment you on the shared services with the town of Innisville. I think anything we can do to share services uh, reduces the operating dollar and uh, impacts our residents. So we need to look at more of that and, and thank you for uh, uh, doing that. Thank you for that, um, Councillor Asadi, and I'll add on that shared services is the shared billing service, which is both um, a, a good thing and a curse. It's a good thing because it's one bill and it saves uh, all that administrative cost. 
At the same time, I still get calls from residents complaining about the price of their hydro when in fact it's the price of their hydro and their water and their wastewater services. Um, speaking of wastewater services, I did have a question in uh, on October, sorry, on April 11th when the provincial government uh, presented the budget bill. There was an item in the bill about real-time reporting for spills and bypasses. And my question to you is, been there any detail about how that regulation will go forward as of yet? And are we prepared to roll out something when the time comes? No details yet in regards to what the requirements will be. Uh, we're currently working with uh, staff to identify concerns and make sure that uh, we're being proactive in regards to when the regs come out that uh, we are we're already set up to move forward. Thank you, and can I ask you in this first quarter, since you're gonna be coming here every quarter, and I'm gonna ask you every quarter, was there any spills or bypasses in this quarter? No, there was not. Thank you so much for that. Anyone else, questions in services? Seeing none, we'll move on to enterprises. Mr. Malcolm's third hat. <laughs> Turn back. So Enterprises is the competitive arm of the utility company. This is where business strategy, economic development uh, plays a key role in ensuring that items that are within the utilities privy to work on is delved into this uh, area of companies. So the communications, telecommunication is the one main source that we have today. Communication towers are scattered throughout uh, Ennisfield to assist with wireless carriers to attach. Uh, one that may be of interest to uh, Sandy Cove is the Sandy Cove uh, tower. We're in detailed design currently. We've uh, received, we went out for our public notification as part of the process, and we received no uh, negative feedback from any of the public. They were all supportive of having this tower put in place and looking forward to having communications uh, attached to these towers as well. So a good news story in regards to the Sandy Cove area. We're also looking at uh, internet service provider and town Wi-Fi services with the town of Innisfil with the IT services division to make sure that can we look at uh, providing rural internet services to the town as well as free Wi-Fi in some of the settlement areas within the town of Innisfil. So those uh, discussions are undergoing and hopefully by the second, third quarter, we'll have more details as to what is available to us as well as what services we can move forward with that we'll bring back to the board of directors and back to the shareholder as well. Uh, in the operation side, uh, we're also exploring a power line construction services company. I have a presentation on the business case for that that uh, will be coming up shortly to give you an idea of what we're thinking about doing in regards to offering power line services, not only to InPower, but to outside of InPower's uh, service territory. We're also looking at uh, control room services. So this is a 24-7 operation where you monitor what's happening out in the system. We have a state-of-the-art facility at Empower in regards to our automation. We've been in discussions with a number of the smaller utilities uh, near us to see if they're interested in working with us in developing this control room service, that we would actually offer this out as a service to other utilities as opposed to just Empower itself. Uh, so we've had uh, about two or three meetings and positive meetings, uh, but until it gets uh, pen to paper. Uh, it's just an idea right now, uh, but the interest has been there by other utilities. Another area that we're looking in regards to enterprises is a locator inspector services. So a one-stop shop, instead of having the water have their locators, the town have their locators, Hydro having their locators, Bell and Rogers having theirs, Enbridge having theirs looking at is there an opportunity to bring locating services within enterprises so that we can take care of all the locates within Innisfil, but also expand that outside of the Innis Innisfil boundaries to offer it to other smaller municipalities and utility companies as well. 
streetlight uh, installation and maintenance services. We're in discussions with the town right now in regards they have a private contractor that does this type of work. There is a benefit to having it in-house and locating it within enterprises, within our companies, in order to ensure that uh, we are doing the installation and maintenance at a lower cost than what may happen with a private contractor. Streetlight design, again, a private contractor designs the streetlights. There's an opportunity for us to do that in enterprises and offer that services not only to the town of Innisfil, but also to neighboring utilities as well. Power generation, we're looking at distributed energy resources, in particular battery storage. So we've had an initial conversation with Tesla in regards to utilizing battery storage here in Innisfil to help offset some of the capital requirements that we're gonna need in the future of servicing Innisfil, but also looking at redundancy so this is an opportunity that we look at in regards to enterprises getting involved in this to set up battery storage that we can utilize in, in, in its fill itself. Currently we do Sentinel lights, so these are the lights that are located on private laneways. We're investigating the viability of this business in uh, the latter part of this year. Uh, a lot of the lighting, uh, especially in commercial lots, they have requirements that are way beyond uh, what is required for roadway lighting. So we're looking at, does it make sense for us to do this type of work or not? Or do we do uh, a service to our commercial customers and to our laneway customers to provide similar services that we would offer to municipalities uh, with the street lighting? So the power line construction business case, uh, this is to give you an update as to why we feel it's important to consider this option in Innisfil. As you know, we're growing rapidly uh, with uh, South Berry coming online with their development, uh, another 30,000 homes projected in that area. The capital works and the program that Empower is gonna be faced over the next uh, 10 to 15 years is gonna be great. Uh, there's a lot of resources that are gonna have to be put in place and the options are available to us to say, do we continue with the model that we currently have by contracting out this type of work? Or do we look at bringing in-house expertise and hiring a staff within enterprises that can not only, not only do the work for InPower to help us over the capital needs, the, the high peak demands, but also look at other utilities in our surrounding areas that we can do work for them as opposed to them hiring a outside construction firm. So the case that we look at, uh, town of Innisfil and South Ferry has a steep growth trajectory. To meet these growing requirements, we're gonna have to invest aggressively in our capital works program. Projections indicate an, apital, an annual capital workload in excess of 6,000 hours until the year 2021. We expect to increase uh, uh, our customer base. We're also looking at a transformer station to help with the load requirements in South Ferry and Innisfil. And this all transition us from currently what we are as a rural utility to a more or urbanized utility. And our present complement of six power line technicians will be inadequate to handle this type of mid to long term growth increase in our capital works. So th this is what we are looking at in regards to looking into the future and seeing what is the requirements for in power in moving out with the construction phases that are happening in the next 10 to 15 years. So this is the operations workload projection for InPower. As you can see on the red line, that's the total. And uh, we're starting to move up rapidly over the course of the years from 2017 to 2018 and beyond. So as new development comes on stream, new overhead poles, new underground cables need to be installed. So looking at the labor costs, external versus in tower, in, internal, Currently, we contract external line crews and equipment for our capital works on an ongoing basis. This has been since the inception of uh, InPower, which was formerly Innisfil Hydro Distribution System. The workload projections uh, show that we'll require additional resources to handle this growth. So we either do it through external, internal, or a combination of both internal and external resources. Uh, over the uh, course of uh, 
using external contractors in the past five years. It's, it's amounted to about $6.5 million in labor charges alone just for the work that we've contracted out currently. The average hourly rates for a five-man construction crew, internally it's about $216, external it's $860 for that same five-person crew. So the alternatives that we're investigating is continue contracting external crews at a premium price. Option two is augment our internal crew at Empower by implementing our own crews and doubling up on our own crews at Empower. That increases our operating maintenance and administration accounts and our costs, which in turn, when we go through a cost of service and the increases to our rate payers, uh, that causes some uh, stress points in regards to how do we handle these costs without increasing the rates to the end user? Third option is to create a power line construction business segment under this enterprise model, hiring a full-time crew. This will offload the capital works that we currently have with our contractor to this new enterprises group. We'll charge a small premium to balance out the operating maintenance and administration function and expenses that this new company would see. And the cost savings for Empower would be the reduction in the premium charge from our current contracted service. And the biggest part is to keep the competency and knowledge within mm -hmm. our group of companies. So the proposal that uh, we were looking at was hire a full-time in-house five-person power line construction crew through Enterprises. Enterprises will create a segment for executing in-house power line projects as well as bid on external project work. So the initial onset would be mostly in power work. As we get uh, settled into this business line, then we would look at external works with other utilities. Equipment uh, is uh, huge expenses. So we've looked at uh, the ability to lease vehicles as opposed to purchasing them in the interim. The savings that we would achieve at the beginning will help fund the program throughout the first few years. If the business succeeds and continues to grow, then you look at purchasing those vehicles as the time is required. And similar to what we do within services is use Empower to have a share of administration, HR and accounting in order to provide the services to this new entity. Some of the things that we looked at in, start in, in regards to starting an operation like this is to seed the capital requirements. So we would need about three months salary for the power line technicians, so to get the uh, it up and running. The capital pro procurement of tools and accessories for the trucks would have to take place. We'd have to look at upgrading our shared services and our administration functions to make sure that the company is has all the software and the administration that it requires to be a viable business. And the capital shall be funded from retained earnings from enterprises, so from our telecommunications and our Sentinel lighting those funds that uh, we have currently sitting in enterprises could use to help fund this startup of this company. So in the immediate short term, it would be Empower's capital projects would provide the initial work. We would offload any overflow capital projects to this new crew, which will primarily reduce the work for expensive contracts that we're currently utilizing today. Long term would to develop and augment this power line team into a revenue generating an entity for the town. We would bid on power line project projects from other small and mid sized utilities and look at consider expansion into other construction or electrical services as needed. So we did a pro forma statement to indicate uh, what the expenses would be with an unburdened and gross cost. And we also looked at if we charged uh, an industry standard of around 20%, what would that mean in regards to the cost structure and the revenue received? So in summary, in order to start this company, it would require about $230,000. With a 20% premium, it would be a profit of approximately 261, which would recover that $230,000 cost in this uh, in this company. And the annual savings for Empower at this profit margin would be around $51,000. So 
So the recommendation is to look to the shareholder to see if this is a business line, a function that you would see uh, us undertaking. This would all have to go through tax implications, financial modeling that we would bring back. We wanted to present this case to the shareholder. We went through the board of directors and uh, they recommended that uh, we present this to the shareholders as well to see if there's an interest and an appetite to move in this direction before we get too far into this business model to see if the shareholders have any questions, concerns, or comments in regards to setting this up. But again, it would be dependent on what would be the tax implications and the financial requirements of this organization. And also looking at our affiliate relationship code with the Ontario Energy Board to make sure that we're on side with the rules and regulations of the Ontario Energy Board in doing this type of work. Thank you very much, Mr. Malcolm. So just to be clear, you're, you're um, not looking for uh, us to pass this recommendation tonight. You're looking for uh, uh, general support or, or direction to keep going, um, recommendation to look further into seeing if, if this would work? That's correct. And through you also, could you, um, are you looking for the recommendation for the government's model tonight? For the governance model, yes, I am. Okay, and and I'm asked, I'm looking at the clerk, so I'm wondering if we have a recommendation for the governance model. And while uh, I'm asking clerks about that, and I'll ask for questions or comments. Councillor Fowler. Uh, under power operations, <coughs> you mentioned the inspector services. You said at one point, once it's established firmly, if I understand correctly, we can expand outside Innisfil and then do it for other communities around. Is that, are you saying we can actually begin to generate income with that, or would it actually reduce the cost overall? If it's set up in enterprises, then it could be set up as a profit generating model. If we did some of these services within InPower, what happens is, is basically it's a reduction in our revenue requirement which uh, doesn't provide us with an opportunity to move outside of our borders to obtain a, a, an income for this corporation that could be passed on to the town of Innisfil as a dividend from enterprises. Councillor Setti. My microphone doesn't want to come on. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, to Mr. Malcolm, it may follow on Councillor Fowler's question. Uh, you had mentioned about bidding on small and mid-sized utilities. Where would those be? Be our neighbors. So typically, a number of small utilities that uh, Collingwood, uh, they have uh, uh, needs uh, with Saga Beach may have needs. So as they're developing and growing in their community, a lot of times they don't have the resources to man those types of capital projects as well. There's not that many companies within Ontario that provide this type of services. And typically when you see the Hydro Ones, the Electras, uh, Toronto mm -hmm. Hydros with their capital programs, they pretty much uh, have the market cornered on the majority of the contractors that are out there. And so this would provide a alternative for the small utilities to utilize another small utility to do some of the work that they would normally contract to other agencies. So when you have the supply and demand, when these other organizations are busy doing works for the larger utilities, the price that they will come out with on a bid will be a lot more because now they would have to hire additional staff, get uh, new equipment on board, and so they're looking at how much effort is going to take place and how much profit will they obtain from doing a, a small job as opposed to continuing on with the larger works that they have contracted out with the larger utilities. So it doesn't have to be within, I was wondering whether it had to be within a close vicinity because Barry is power stream and I'm not sure if Bradford is the same and others have gone so, but you're saying calling him one so, it, you're looking at probably in the Simcoe County region area? Yeah, definitely. And there's uh, opportunities in Eastern and uh, Central Ontario as well to look at offsetting some of the work that they need to, to complete. Uh, so like I said, we're investigating, we're talking to a number of utilities to see what their, what their thoughts are in regards to their contracting out services and seeing if there's a viable model here that we can utilize that we can provide a service to them. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and then a follow-up question, Your Worship. Uh, just, uh, there was one other one when you were uh, giving the options, uh, one, two, and three, um, the internal, external crews and the costs uh, to the taxpayers. You're, you're talking about, uh, I think, I just want to clarify my understanding of it. If you're going through enterprises, it's hard to remember all these different companies, uh, through enterprises, is there a cost to the rate payers? Like how is this going to impact the rate payers? So uh, from the rate payers point of view, if we're providing a service to InPower at a lower cost than a premium service that we would get from external contractor, then the cost, our overall cost at Empower would be reduced by utilizing this company as opposed to using the dollars and spending the money at a premium cost for having a, an external company do it. It'd be more internal. So the structure could be set up at a profit margin mm -hmm. because it's owned by uh, the town of Venniceville. They could say that for internal works, the profit is zero and we provide our services at the same cost that it would be our regular crews in order to provide an advantage to our existing ratepayers in the Empower model. So there's options that are available. Okay, thank you. Councilor Van Berkel. Thank you, Worship. Actually, my question was the same, just on the internal, external cost. Um, but I do wonder, because there's such a big difference, does the internal cost also include the equipment, the trucks, tools, whatever, or and, and does the, the external cost? The internal cost is the labor component that was on that slide. So Okay, the, what about the external? Was that just the labor component that's labor. too? Yeah, so we're comparing apples to apples, labor costs. That was my question, thank you. Councillor Waters. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just, I think I have three questions. Uh, first of all, was to do with the distributed energy potential uh, in terms of, you're talking about battery storage to uh, offset peak loading. Are you looking at uh, like a residential size systems or are you looking more commercial systems? Both, so looking at uh, what, what we envision if we go down this road, if it's a viable option is to look at our transformer station, including battery storage at the transformer station. So charge up the batteries during a low consumption time period. And then during the day when the consumption goes up, you utilize the batteries to offset our costs. So mm -hmm. it's a premium price to pay electricity during the daytime. So if we could capture that at a lower cost at night, then that helps us with uh, the, the peak uh, during the day. Also gives us an opportunity that instead of uh, building lines or building stations, utilizing the battery storage to actually act like a distribution station where the load would come from the batteries as opposed to coming from the distribution lines itself. So help reducing the cost of building a brand new station by utilizing battery storage instead. Could you still use that battery? Could you, could, could you use that battery storage on a, a residential uh, system in terms of having uh, offering that to residents as, uh, as peak reduction, but also it could also offer backup for power uh, when power goes out? Yeah, Tesla has a uh, battery pack for residential use. So as part of these discussions, we'll be entertaining what uh, their model looks like in regards to having power packs at residential residences to see what it looks like. What is the cost? What is the benefit to the consumer? How does the utility role play in regards to providing this service to the customer so that the customer may pay us a sort of a rental fee similar to a modem in your house for uh, Rogers mm -hmm. internet. This may be the same idea where we charge a fee for having the battery pack within the house, but we take care of all the maintenance and the capital costs of installing it. Okay, excellent. And one other question. Um, do you think you're gonna receive any backlash from uh, private companies who are saying, well, what's the uh, government's role is to be offering those services which are, uh, you know, which are required by the community as opposed to competing uh, with business. I've, I've heard this argument, not that I'm for or against it, just in terms of do you expect any backlash from the private companies who do these businesses because there's several uh, intrusions here into, into private enterprise, which I could see a few of these people saying, what is government doing in this? I look at it as a complement to what they're currently doing today. Uh, there's a lot of work out there, not enough resources, if you look at the skilled trades coming out of the colleges, it's sort of decreasing. 
Uh, we're having issues hiring skilled labor. So this is an opportunity that uh, I think we complement what they're doing. We're not taking business away from them. I think we're complementing and providing a service where there's excess need in the community. Thank you. Thank you, and, and on that note, I'll use for an example the cell towers that, that we built. Um, certainly, um, every um, um, operator, Bell and Rogers and TELUS, have had the opportunity for years to come in here and um, provide better service for our residents as far as cell service is concerned. And, uh, and you know, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Uh, and quite often they um, are not, um, don't want to share, so they each want their own tower. They don't want to build on one tower. So we took the bull by the horns and we put the towers where we wanted them, which is usually with, within town-owned land um, where there wasn't uh, a, a large outcry that people didn't want them, like in a park or, uh, you know, to obstruct a, a view, that kind of thing. And then we use it as a revenue generating tool by renting space on those towers to sell operators, cell service operators. So a good example is the Sandy Cove. There's, I'm always getting people at Sandy Cove upset about the cell service there. So we've been able to uh, solve a problem and create a revenue generating opportunity at the same time. Are we encroaching on the, on the big operators? I guess we are, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> So we've um, had good discussion and uh, we have a recommendation up on the board uh, that uh, the delegation um, be received, all three of them, and that we endorse in principle the expansion of the business segment and also the governance review for in-services. I'd like to add to that recommendation to the clerks if I could. Um, it would be my recommendation that we look at the minimum number of board members being five under the board governance review piece. Uh, the uh, board governance paper recommended a minimum of five, a maximum of seven. Given the climate of, uh, of, of the government today, I think less is better. So I would, I would suggest um, a, number, a five member board is quite sufficient at this time, unless anyone else had any other suggestions. Councilor Waters. I understand uh, the position that you're taking. I was just wondering whether or not um, somebody from outside the organization sitting on a board might provide some, some solutions to uh, issues that we're having. And I'm thinking like an, an innovator role uh, that on, on, on the business side, on the technology side, that might bring, like it could be a professor from a university or, or something along the lines, it could, it could bring that innovation role since that seems what we're interested in. So I thought that if you, I think you'd have to go to seven. Uh, people, but a role like that I think would be advantageous to the uh, to the organization. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Malcolm, how many of the five or seven would be would be mandatory? I think that would be myself and the CAO, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So the municipal shareholder has two, which is the mayor and the CAO. And if you went to five, then there'd be three independent. So one of those three could be that role that you're talking about. Okay. Right. Could I ask for a mover and a seconder for the recommendation? That would be uh, Councillor Fowler, Councillor Waters. Um, any more discussion? All those in favour? That's carried. I want to thank you very much for your time and for all of your staff for being here uh, tonight too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So Council, we are going to uh, move uh, to in camera after we have a resolution giving us that authority and that's Councillor Fowler and Councillor Van Berkel. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you everyone and uh, it's 6.39 now. We'll be back here at 7 o'clock to have our um, regular council meeting. Thank you.
Good evening, Council and members of the audience. Looking forward to, uh, to our meeting this evening. Uh, I'm, we're just finishing up a tiny bit of business from our special council meeting, and then we'll move right into our uh, regular meeting for this evening. So I need a recommendation for the uh, to rise from closed session, and that would be Councillor Nickel and Councillor Van Berkel. All those in favor? That's carried. And our recommendation to deal with the uh, item that we dealt with in closed session, a mover and a seconder, Councillor Waters, Councillor Payne, all those in favor? That's carried. Confirming bylaw. Councillor Van Berkel, Councillor Isis, all those in favor? That's carried. An adjournment from our special council meeting at 702 would be Councillor Fowler and Councillor Isis, all those in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much. So now I will again welcome everybody here for our uh, regular council meeting on April the 24th. Thank you so much for those who are here in person and for those who are here uh, on, on our uh, web uh, cast. Uh, and I wanted to acknowledge uh, former Councillor Dario who's here tonight. Welcome back to the Council Chambers, Council Dario. Uh, we will start with a uh, opening of the meeting and the um, to let you know that if you do have a cell phone or any other electronic device, if you would please set it to silent. And public comments made during this meeting are audio and video recorded. We are live streaming and we sh it shall form part of the town's record and that's retained according to the town's retention bylaw. And for more information of the retention bylaw, you can speak to anyone in the clerk's office and they'd be happy to share that information with you. So we have open forum, uh, which is the first item on the agenda, which uh, allows people to sign up and speak to items on the agenda. We had no one signing up on that tonight. So we'll move to the approval of the agenda. So I need a recommendation to approve the agenda uh, for April 24th as printed and circulated. Thank you. A mover and a seconder. Councillor Isis and Councillor Fowler. All those in favor? That's carried. I was remiss. I didn't see another former councillor hiding in the back row. <laughs> oh, councillor Bill Lougheed is here with us tonight to welcome Councillor Lougheed. All right. So uh, disclosure of interest. Is there anyone who has a uh, conflict of interest or disclosure? Seeing none, if one becomes apparent to you during the meeting, please uh, let the clerk's office know so that we can record it properly in the minutes. So our very first um, and very exciting presentation tonight is to welcome Christy Alford. And Christy is going to talk to us about her trip to Abu Dhabi and maybe a little uh, about her experience. Welcome, uh, I want you to know how uh, proud we all are of you, Christy. Hi. Christy's trip to Abu Dhabi 2019 Special Olympics World Games. Next. Oh. <laughs> My sports and events. Athletics, 100 meters silver, mini javelin gold, relay gold. Flying to Abu Dhabi. Flying to Abu Dhabi took 13 hours, but was really cool. We flew over Iceland, where we stayed, Dubai Festival City. It was very nice. Opening, ceremony, opening ceremonies, making new friends. And this is my mini javelin. It's a little video. <laughs> إذن رمي الرمح 
لهذه الفئة إذا الكندية تحقق One hundred meter run. In my one hundred meter, I got a silver with thirteen nine three seconds. That's not my fastest, but it's okay. <laughs> four by one hundred meter relay, fifty four seventy four seconds to run the four by one hundred relay. We did awesome. That was my team. Closing ceremonies. This was the best experience of my life. Meeting new. Meeting people from around the world and knowing I can do things even if I have an intellectual disability. Things we did. Went to a place called Urban Nights. Went to a mosque. Went to the biggest mall called Dubai Mall. Seen the tallest building in the world. Went to a park with rides. And that, and that was it. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Christy. And I, wa I want to tell you, uh, I want you to tell the audience what you told me when we met in Bradford a few weeks ago about your time um, that with, um, I can't remember if it was with the relay or the, or the 100 meter. Who did you beat? Who did you get a better time then? You told me you, you beat the boys time. Yeah, they get like 45. Yay. <laughs> Girl power. <laughs> okay, to ask council to join me uh, out front, please. Thank you, Council, and I know that uh, Councillor Fowler, I'm sure, would be loving to move this motion as Councillor Fowler was following Christy on social media the entire time and spreading the word. So it was <laughs> moved by Councillor Fowler, seconded by Councillor Van Berkel. Any other comments or questions, uh, comments to Christy before we uh, move forward? Seeing none, all in favor of the recommendation? And that's carried un unanimously. Thank you so much, Christy, for, uh, for making us, and for, for coming here tonight, too. We know you're a hot ticket, and it's hard to get it in your calendar with all of your, all of your events, but we're really proud that you came and spent. Oh, good. 
I hope you have, now you have time to play, to play floor hockey again. <laughs> Thanks, Christy. Okay, next on our agenda tonight is a delegation from our Chief of Police, Andrew Fletcher, and he's going to talk to us about a community safety and well-being plan. Chief, whenever you're ready. Good evening, uh, Mayor Dolan, Deputy Davidson, members of Council. Thank you for allowing me a few moments today just to uh, bring the Council up to speed on our initiative around partnering for a safer community here in the town of Innisfil, the town of Bradford, West Gwillimbury, and throughout the county. And as is mentioned on the start of the slide, partnering for a safer community is about the community safety and well-being strategy for our communities, and it really is a partnership. This is not necessarily a police-led initiative. It is a municipally-led initiative, but uh, we have taken a, a bit of a lead role in this over the past number of years and are happy to bring you up to speed uh, some of the work that we've undertaken so far. Just to give you a bit of a background on where we're at and the journey we've undertaken. So in 2007, well over 10 years ago, the community mobilization model was created for the province of Ontario for policing. And that model I'll touch on a little bit later, but it, uh, it began the journey for us in policing around how we move us from a crisis response over to a social development response, bordering on risk intervention and uh, prevention along the way. 2011, Prince Albert, Saskatchewan um, looked at a, a hub model where they looked at how they could address some of those risk, risky behaviors through what they called a situation table. And of course, as we often do in many, uh, many areas, we looked at what they did and government said, hey, can we bring that here to Ontario? And we said, we already, we're already down that path with our 2007 model and we're already looking about situation tables in a lot of other areas. So fast forward, 2016. Um, the Community Safety and Wellbeing Planning Framework was introduced by the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services, and we started partnering with other agencies, other social service agencies, education, um, healthcare, to look at what that would look like from a collaborative approach from a community safety and well-being perspective. And it's more than just community safety, it's now about the well-being perspective because that brings others into that envelope and others into that conversation. If it's just about community safety, we are legislated and mandated responsible for community safety. But when we start talking about well-being, it adds a whole new perspective to us and starts bringing those other silos and those other agencies into partnership with us. And fast forward, 2017, we started the work here in this community around developing our plan. We came to council, and I'll touch on that a little bit earlier. Back in 2016, we came to council and did a presentation, introduced the concepts, and we started doing some work under a grant and uh, did some work towards where we are today. And fast forward, January 1st, 2019, legislation was introduced as part of the, um, uh, what's called now the Comprehensive Policing uh, Act and it uh, brings the responsibility back to the uh, uh, mandate of the municipalities and legislative responsibility for community safety and well-being plans. So I told you I'd touch on this model a little bit further just to give you some ideas to what it involves, and you'll see that that model is, uh, moves from left to right, red over to green, the red side being the crisis, through to risk intervention, over to prevention, and into social development, and it's, uh, it's colored for that way obviously for the purpose of red's dangerous and obviously through the yellow light and into the green light on the right hand side keeps it simple from a color perspective but as we start looking at that model we start identifying where is the different parts parts of it and where are the different responsibilities obviously in the crisis area the emergency responders police fire paramedic services other areas targeted proactive enforcement and it has to be proactive it can't always be reactive but it really looks at that crisis intervention piece when we move more to the risk intervention section, we look at mobilizing other agencies, mobilizing others to problem solve some of those risky behaviors in the community and how we can move us away from crisis by addressing those risks. As we move further to the right, what we wanna do is move to what we call the prevention ring, which is where we support local initiatives to prevent that risky behavior and get ahead of it. And then ultimately the best solution is to look at engaging human and social services from a social development perspective so that we can ingrain that in people's lives and people's development rather than leading through to prevention and into crisis. So the more work we do up front, obviously the greater return and investment down the road. When you strip all that away, what we look at as our model is really moving around from uh, community being at the center because it's around community safety planning and the community's got to be a key to it. Social development through prevention into risky intervention and then emergency response. And ultimately emergency response will always be a part of that model, but we want to try and reduce the amount of emergency response and put more effort on the social development and prevention. And as you'll see in the tagline at the bottom, our motto is don't do it ourselves. We want to mobilize and engage others to do that with us because it can't just be about emergency response. It has to be that collaborative approach from all the partners in all the sectors. 
When we looked at uh, that model, we identified five key planning principles and what we should do is moving forward. The first one being commitment at the highest level. So it has to be municipally mandated, highest priority, leadership in the community and accountability. Once the, once the municipalities make this a priority and make this a, a mandated responsibility, then people will take action and will start doing that. As a police chief, we've made that a, a part of our uh, mantra day in, day out, is to show that leadership around moving forward. And I know from working with the CAOs of the town, we've got the same commitment from the municipalities. We then look at our next planning key pr uh, principle is that it has to be collaborative. We cannot do this ourselves. We have to look at it be multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary, and it has to be a shared responsibility between the police, the communities, and other social service providers and other, other providers of those uh, needs in the community. When we move beyond the collaborative part of it, it has to be risk-focused. We have to ask ourselves, why are we going into these communities looking at the greatest needs, whether it's individual need, family needs, or neighborhood needs? And you can strip that away to look at intersection related, or park related. You start looking at the risk focus. Why are, we where, why are we there and what are we addressing? If we're not there to address risk, then we're just patrolling without a purpose. We're not really in a community for a proper need. And that's where we start looking at those risks, and I'll touch on that a little bit further as to why that's important to us. The next key principle for us is moving towards an asset-based approach. We know there's great things going on in these communities already. We don't need to reinvent the wheel, but we need to do an asset inventory and look at the neighbors, community. What exists in the community right now? What service providers are already funded through grants or other purposes to provide some of that key work that needs to get done? And how do we mobilize them and collaborate with them to bring everybody together and look at the assets and pull everybody working all in, rowing in the same direction? And then the last principle for us is it has to have measurable outcomes. And these are outcomes, not outputs. We can very quickly measure how many tickets we give out, but have we changed the behaviors? Have we actually made a better outcome for the community? Whether that's mental health crisis, whether that's addictions, other areas, we have to look at an outcome, not necessarily out. We can continue to hand out tickets, but are we changing the behaviors and making our roads safe? So we start to focus more on, on measuring those outcomes instead of outputs. One of the things we're doing is we're trying to look at it from an evidence-based approach, and we start looking at the data and what's ex what exists to allow us to prioritize things within our community. So when we look at those priorities, we have to say, okay, there's risk tracking databases out there that are collecting all sorts of data, whether in the health world, the policing world, education worlds, um, employment rates, all sorts of data is collected that we can then say, how do, we, how do we look at that from a risk perspective and then plot that against some strategies? When we move beyond collecting the data, we then want to use that data to inform a longer term strategy not short-term, but longer-term strategies and how we need to invest our time, effort, and energy. And then lastly, when we look at it from that social development ring, we want to look at what data says, you know, tells us what evidence of ongoing systemic risk reforms in, informs policy and practice going forward. So it's about taking that data and working with the data to inform our decision-making going forward. So a couple of examples, what would that look like? So we need to identify vulnerable groups identify risk factors, and then select what we call protective factors. It's not all about the bad, but there's a whole bunch of really good protective factors that occur. So if you take one example, we know that one of the identifiable vulnerable groups is youth age 12 to 17, and one of the things we look at is mental health and family circumstance as an identified risk, whether that's a broken family, whether that's mental health situations, anxiety, going through school, whatever the case may be, we know those are some of the identified risk factors. And then what are some of the protective factors that exist Obviously, the stability of the family unit is a huge protective factor. Adequate parental supervision, personal coping skills. Do we provide them those skills to cope themselves? And then effective problem-solving skills within the family unit. So those are some of the protective factors that exist, and how do we exploit those? And if they don't exist, then how do we get them from other sources, whether that's through schools, sports teams, social clubs? How do we provide those protective factors in the community? So then we take that and we look at those risk factors and then we identify our outcomes. And we have to benchmark objectives, key objectives. So in this particular example, part of our outcome would be increased awareness of signs of mental, uh, mental illness in the family, increased capacity of parents to support the youth throughout it, and then it, ultimately a decreased number of youth identifying with risks around mental health. Those are some, some general outcomes that we could plot and work towards. And then we have to then take that, sorry, and uh, we have to then specify the tasks and how we're going to measure those tasks going forward. So we want to look at things like educating parents uh, on mental health awareness. We want to look at programs such as Triple P, uh, positive parenting programs that exist in other communities. And again, looking at that asset inventory that's out there and say, what programs exist? What measures can we put in place to address that from a strategic perspective? So just to bring you up to speed on some of that work that's been undertaken so far, as I touched on earlier, May 2016, we presented in front of council, both here and in Bradford, um, the concept of community safety and well-being. And at the time, the Council of the Day endorsed us moving forward and starting to invest some time, effort, and energy with the towns to move towards that path. 
in anticipation that it might be legislated someday, but even if it wasn't, it was still a good practice to start looking in that risk intervention piece and looking at the outcomes measurements and looking at how we engage others. So it was an exercise well worth taking and a journey well worth taking at the time. As we move forward, spring of 2017, we applied for grant funding through what's called the Proceeds of Crime Grant. Proceeds of Crime Grant is a federal grant program for all the proceeds that we take off the bad guys every time we arrest somebody, or every time we break down a drug house or whatever the case may be, those proceeds are put into a pot and we can then apply for that money once a year to fund programs and initiatives within the community for the good. So taking bad money and turning it into good programs. So we applied for and received a two-year Proceeds of Crime, Crime Grant Fund, which allowed us to hire a consultant a gentleman by the name of Dr. Hugh Russell, who was one of the pioneers of community safety and well-being from the Bancroft area and has implemented similar plans across the province so far and was a real guide for us moving our plan forward and giving us some tips on what we could do. To go along with that, the ministry published a number of booklets. So they published three booklets that talked about crime prevention, talked about the direction we should be going and provided us some tools on what we should use to look at other examples you know, the second booklet was called A Snapshot of Local Voices. They did an assessment out in other communities, what's working, what programs exist. Not to say you have to use those programs, but to give us some idea of what exists out there. So then we move forward into January 30th, 2018. We held our very first initial stakeholder meeting. We pulled stakeholders from a number of the agencies in the community, a number of the stakeholders, whether it's from the health sector, the education sector, the county, paramedic services, ourselves, so many other, you know, were represented there. And, and presented the concept of moving forward and asked if they were the right people that should be at that table and if they weren't, who should be? Who was missing from the table? And started planting some of those seeds about moving our plan forward over the next number of years. April 2018, we hired a project coordinator. A lady by the name of Carrie Warner came on staff with us, again paid by that Proceeds of Crime grant, and she came on board and started uh, updating herself. She comes from a health background, from a senior's background, so she's very, very aware of what some of the risks and some of the need are and has those connections and uh, engagement with the health community already, so was able to help us move that yardstick a little bit further down the path as well. And Carrie's done some tremendous work for us as far as developing terms of reference, getting the, the work plan started to develop, and the getting us on board as to those first steps that we need to, uh, needed to take. August 28th, we then held our second community planning meeting. Again, invited a similar group back as came was uh, involved in on the January meeting, but expanded it. And we started now probing a little bit deeper as to what they thought the needs of the community were, what they thought was a risk from within their own sectors. And what we learned from that meeting was that really we didn't understand where we wanted to go. And the people started focusing in their own silos and not looking at the broader community safety and well-being perspective. So we had to strip that back and, and, and really take a, a breath and figure out where we wanted to go and how we can continue to move this forward. Of course, we went through a couple of elections, provincial and municipal elections in that time period, slowed down our, our planning process because we wanted to make sure we were in front of the right council at the right time and get the endorsement of this council moving forward because we anticipated it was going to be a 2019 plan. Sure as Anthem, throughout that fall, we, although we were slowed down a little bit, we continued to develop our work plans, some terms of reference, and we created two groups. We had, we had created a coordinating committee, which is represented at the highest levels of the two municipalities, the CAOs and the chief of police, as well as our coordinator, coming together to start developing a terms of reference for us as to how we would coordinate that plan moving forward. And then the next one was to develop an advisory committee of some of those key stakeholders, and we started working on those terms of reference through the fall of last year. And sure as Anthony, as, uh, as we kind of predicted way back in 2017, January 1st, 2019, um, the legislation was presented by the, the new government and uh, municipalities were then legislatively re made uh, mandated responsible for developing a community safety plan, and I'll touch on that as to give you an idea as to what that legislation says. So under the Community Safety and Policing Act, um, in the new sections, it talks, this is a direct quote out of the legislation, that every municipality shall prepare and by resolution adopt a community safety and well-being plan. Doesn't say may, doesn't say, you know, should. It's very clear that they shall. Um, and then they talk a little bit further, it says it can be prepared individually or it can be prepared jointly. So a municipality that's maybe in a, in a region, uh, such as the region I came from, can take four municipalities and have a regional plan. We are looking at that with our county and what that looks like going forward, but we've elected to go the journey so far because we've already down that path of creating our own plans. Let's not slow the process and go back to the first, first days and start digging in further. We're already well advanced and you'll see a little bit of some of the work that we've done and hopefully the county will start to adopt some of the work we've done and come on board with us and I'll touch on that in a bit. The last piece in the legislation is it says that we shall establish an advisory committee. And we have, like I mentioned to you, we've already looked at that advisory committee and the terms of reference for that and what it would look like. And we've talked to that first stakeholder meeting around who would like to be involved and on what level. Thankfully, in the legislation, they came out and they told us, well, this is what the advisory committee must, at a minimum, consist of. 
So they said it must have a person who represents health. We've got that. Education, we've got that checked off. Community or social services, again, the counties come on board. Custodial services of children and youth, that's things like probation and parole services for youth and children. Police services and the police services board must have representation, so that's myself as a chief and the board has delegated that authority to me moving forward. And then the second part says an employee of the municipality or member of council. And so far in our plan, we've elected to utilize the CAO as an employee of the municipality. We know how busy the council members are, so we recognize the role that the, the CAO could play and then developing staff moving forward from there. And then the last piece was any other person prescribed by the minister. Again, when you start talking about indigenous communities, they want some representation of those communities, and so the minister can prescribe based on the community. The key thing with these community safety wall and being plans is they have to be driven by the community, because every community is different. Every municipality is different. What works in Bancroft may be different than what works here, and it's going to be very different than what works in Toronto. And you start looking at some of the rural communities, again, it's got to be made in Innisfil for Innisfil based on our risk and based on our needs of this community. And that's why that last piece is in there about anything else prescribed. So what are the next steps for us? That little chart on the right is actually from the last booklet that the ministry put out, which is a planning framework and identified some of the pieces that we can look at. And it talks about, well, obviously, the champion being the council and the, uh, you know, then moving towards a coordinator, which we have that coordinating committee. And then a multi-sectoral advisory body, which we currently are looking towards, and then the implementation teams to carry out some of those strategies. So for us, the next steps obviously is to appear before council, before this council and before the Bradford Council, and to get your approval and endorsement to move forward with this work and support of the work that we're doing over the next couple of years. The legislation says that we have two years from that date of January 1st, 2019, to adopt and by resolution adopt that plan. So we have 2019, 2020, by January 1, 2021, we have to have our plan in place, which we're confident we'll have. We obviously have to establish a formal advisory committee, and, and we've already got the grassroots of that forming. We've already had some stakeholder engagement. We know there's people interested, and they're just waiting for that next step of saying, okay, council said go, make forth, and we will get things happening, and we will uh, establish that advisory committee. The next piece, and we've already started down this path, the data analysis. So when we start looking at that data that exists, We've worked with our county, they have a data consortium, they have all sorts of health data, we know we have education data, we have police sector data, so we're looking at that data already and start um, digging into it. We got our first meeting coming up in about a week's time um, to talk with the county around what data they can share with us. The privacy commissioner has already weighed in on this stuff and said it's de-identified information, we're not going to start sharing information about personal health records and that sort of stuff, but we want to look at the different areas and identify what data exists to tell us inform the risk in the community, whether that's homelessness, whether that's addictions, whether that's uh, mental health. Again, we want to look at the data so it's an evidence-based approach. We can probably take a pretty good guess right now as to what those areas are going to be, but we want to be able to back it up with something when people challenge it later, say, why are you putting your efforts into that? Well, because the data shows that we should be. And then the next piece, once, we had, once we've identified what the data tells us from a risk perspective is then overlay that with that asset inventory. So we're gonna work with our stakeholder group to say what assets exist currently in the community. We've already done a little bit of that over the last six months, identifying some of the programs that exist, but we need to formalize that and make sure we haven't missed somebody and identified something that's already out there. And then last from that, we'll identify our priorities and into 2020, we're probably looking at developing strategies to address those priorities and moving forward with a plan of action and have a formalized uh, release of that plan. So you have a report in front of you. I think uh, it's just a quick staff report that I provided you in advance of today's meeting, which gives you a little bit of a high level, but in the, at the end, you'll see there's a, a recommendation to council um, that you declare that safety and well-being in South Simcoe is a priority, which I know that, uh, you know, well respected by this county, that you know the, and understand that, that you direct municipal administration and staff to work together in developing the South Simcoe Community Safety and Well-Being Plan. And again, we're already down that path with the CAO and uh, members of his team working with us already. And then last, the recommendation that you seek to support from the administration of Simcoe County to support the development of that plan. We have to get the county engaged in this because they provide so many of those social services, the housing services, the health services, that they have to be involved in the plan. And I'm so um, proud to tell you that the recent is two weeks ago in a meeting, they have committed to come on board. I think they were sitting back a little bit to see if where people were going to be at and if they were going to be mandated, but I, you know, we've got the commitment now from the CAO's office at the county to come on board with us. So it's, uh, I think it's a bit of a no-brainer as far as the three recommendations, but I did want to present those to Council today. And I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Chief. Questions to Chief Fletcher? Seeing none, I just want to uh, let you know a couple of things. First of all, how nice it is to have two and a half years of work 
uh, head start on the other 443 municipalities in Ontario when the Solicitor General uh, made these mandatory. Uh, to know that we were that far ahead of the curve is, uh, is certainly reassuring. And I would also say that uh, if anybody questions the need for one of these, the recent tragedy that we had in our town just 24 hours ago certainly speaks to the need for such work to be done. And, and, it's, and I do commend you for all of that. Um, my question is in regards to calling it the South Simcoe um, Community um, Safety and Wellbeing Plan. I wondered, um, I understand why obviously, South Simcoe Police, but it, will people then understand that to mean also New Tecumseh and Agila Tazarantio, or will they, get, will they get that that is South Bradford and Innisfil? We're hoping that by branding it, we will say it's a South Simcoe, and then we will say there's two chapters to that plan, but rather than create two individual plans, it'll be one plan and the two chapters, because again, the risks that's identified in Bradford might be different than the risk identified here. They're probably gonna be close, but we wanna make sure they develop that. You know, I would anticipate New Tecumseh will have a New Tecumseh plan. Barry will have a Barry plan because that's what the that's what the Met legislation calls for is your own council to adopt that plan. Um, we could separate the two out and call it the Innisfil plan. We call it the Bradford plan. Um, but with the work that's ongoing, again, it ties us to the county as well, which was important for us to make sure that Simcoe County is named in there, so they feel they're a stakeholder and a part of that. Absolutely, and if you need any help, the deputy mayor and I, uh, if you need any help at the county, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, you know, when you talked about the legislation and the shall part, it goes as far as to say, if after um, the time that they're mandated, a municipality doesn't have one of these completed, that the ministry will complete it for them and send them a bill. So uh, it, it is something to be taken seriously and I thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Rayner. Thank you, Your Worship, members of council. I just wanted to echo uh, Your Worship's comments uh, to thank the Chief for his leadership in this area. Um, he's uh, grabbed the bull by the horns, I, I would suggest, uh, and is making sure that uh, both of our communities are well suited. Uh, we were at a CAO county meeting uh, not very long ago, and a number of them are still learning about the fact that this is an obligation. So they are, as you said, Your Worship, quite quite a few steps behind us on this. I also wanted to assure Council that, that uh, every effort is being made not to duplicate or reinvent the wheel. Uh, that when you talk about community safety and well-being, uh, we, there are uh, uh, multiple players, multiple agencies, multiple jurisdictional issues that are at play, that the two communities have two different lens today, although we know the lens are gone, uh, so they may have different health, Ontario health teams. Uh, we have a health and wellness center here. We are hiring a health and wellness catalyst, uh, who, by the way, should be on board uh, within the next few weeks. Uh, and the, the idea is not to duplicate efforts across these different uh, uh, objectives and priorities, but in fact, to consolidate, uh, have the agencies come to, to one or two tables to be able to have those discussions uh, and make sure that we're, we're aligning those priorities across all of the agencies that touch our community on these priorities. And, uh, I think the chief would agree with me that that in itself is actually a huge, huge uh, amount of work, but will be a huge milestone because uh, you can't talk about vulnerable populations uh, and ignore the health side or the emergency services side or uh, the community support side. So bringing all of those people together in that priority in a multidisciplinary team, I think, is, is going to not only be effective, but we know the research tells us that interdisciplinary teams are the most likely to come up with innovative solutions, and I'll add cost-effective solutions. Um, and I think, uh, so I think that's where we're going with this, and I, I'm very excited uh, about where we'll go in the next few years. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Rayner. Could I have a mover and a seconder uh, for the motion, Councillor Payne and Councillor Van Berkel? And before I call the vote, if I could uh, just take this moment to embarrass the chief, um, and congratulate him on being selected for induction into the Evidence-Based Policing Hall of Fame. Uh, well deserved, and we're so proud of you, and congratulations. Well, as I touched on here, it's, it's gotta be evidence-based, right? So it's, uh, what does it tell us where we need to go, and if it's not, then let's stop doing it. <laughs> Thank you, chief. Thank you. All in favor of the recommendation? Those opposed?
That's carried unanimously. Thank you for your support. Thank and you. And I should mention the, uh, from the funding perspective, our Proceeds of Crime grant does carry us through into the remainder of 2019 and into the beginning of 2020 um, based on the government cycle of funding. So we do have to fund it as far as that coordinator role until that time. So there's no expense to the municipality other than our time at this point. So. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Um, and, I'll, I, and to Christy's family, you're welcome to stay like till you know nine o'clock tonight, but it, please, if you feel you need to sneak out, we will not be offended, I promise. Um, and that goes to anyone else who, who came, to see, came to see a particular part of the agenda. It's uh, certainly feel free, um, except for the council members. I'm not gonna let them go. <laughs> Thank you very much. So the next item on the agenda is uh, a delegation, and it is from Scott and Joan Donnie, 5 Cook Avenue, Cookstown, service allocation request. Thank you, Mayor Dolan. We're going to need a taller uh, microphone yes. <laughs> there, Mr. Donnie. Thank you, Mayor Dolan. Thank you, Council. Um, I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of my parents, uh, Clive and Joan Donnie. Uh, about their property of 5 Cook Avenue in Cookstown and uh, that residence being considered for a lot allocation. Uh, I'm going to give you a little history. About five years ago, they met with uh, Tim Kane from the town to have them, him come and look at their properties to see if the, um, it was big enough to have a lot put on the back of it. Um, when he was there, he uh, did a bunch of measurements and did a bunch of calculations and uh, it fit all the criteria right down to that there is an actual sewer hookup on the lot line for that lot. Um, but at the time they decided that they weren't going to pursue it. Um, and as you know, things change and people get older, um, they have decided now that uh, they're a little older and both retired that it would be nice to have a smaller house and lot and would like to maybe get it allocated. Um, on March 26, we met with Nick Scarata here at the town and he can, told us to come and speak to you tonight and uh, to consider the lot for allocation. During that meeting, he uh, told us that sometime within the next year or so that there would be a review on the lots in Cookstown. And so he just asked that we come here tonight and ask your consideration for their lot to be allocated. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Donnie. Can I ask Mr. Kane if he might uh, tell us when we might be having this discussion about allocation? Sure, Your Worship, and, uh, and to the delegation. Um, we were planning to give Council a report uh, to update this spring. It will probably come to a May Council meeting. What that report will do will be to summarize the various requests that we've had to date. Um, just to remind Council, too, about you know, the limited allocation numbers that we have. Uh, and where we're at in the environmental assessment process for the options for increasing sewage allocation to Cookstown. So I'm hoping to bring that report to Council in May. Um, thanks to the delegation tonight, uh, 5 Cook Avenue will be added to that list of requests. Um, in terms of actually allocating, uh, we will be waiting until March of next year. Um, you may or may not recall, but in the allocation process to date, uh, March uh, of 2020 uh, was the date for people that had received the offer of allocation to actually fulfill that allocation offer. So as we get close to that date, we'll know what numbers we actually have uh, in play to reallocate, because the whole idea was not to have people sitting on allocation they weren't going to use. Uh, and then uh, we'll be giving council several options in terms of what, you know, what is the, what is the best value and, and what, are the, um, what are the options for uh, giving out that remaining allocation. So that'll be coming update report this May and then an allocation uh, options presented to council spring of next year. Thank you, Mr. Kane. And can we, um, is there a way through the clerk's office that anyone who is on that allocation list, including the Donnies, get notification of the night that council's going to receive that report so that they uh, can be here to listen to debate if they so wish? I'm seeing nods, so I'm guessing that's okay. <laughs> All right, any anybody have questions or comments to Mr. Donnie? Seeing none, then thank you very much for your thank, presentation. Thank you very much. And the recommendation on the screen is to receive the information and, and we'll, we'll keep you posted. Uh, that's moved by Councillor Nichol and seconded by Councillor Waters. All those in favor? 
That's carried. Thank you. We'll now move into item seven, which is County Council, Municipal Association, and Conservation Authority and Committee updates. Uh, and I'll ask first if uh, the Deputy Mayor has any County Council updates. It was, it was really uh, mostly business as usual at the County Council meeting last week. We did get some pretty positive reports about our uh, hazardous waste diversion rates, and we also did get some kind of discouraging reports about the, um, about the amount people are using their green bin. Hence, you will, so, you will see uh, added uh, educational opportunities through um, ads and newspaper ads and television ads that food is uh, not garbage and to feed your green bin. So if everybody can, uh, can help get that message across, that would be wonderful. Any other uh, County Conservation Authority um, committee updates? See, done. Well, sorry. sure, yep, Councillor Sadi. Thank you, Your Worship. Just a, an update that uh, from the, on behalf of the library board, library board members just received uh, word um, just uh, last Friday of the, uh, the first in the provincial uh, funding cuts. And uh, this, uh, they received a, a, a communication from the Southern Ontario Library Service that effective uh, April 26, uh, that they uh, will, um, the uh, doing, they're just cutting the uh, interlibrary loan services and that's an important service that is uh, connects our residents with materials from other libraries. So that's the, the first uh, impact that we've heard of. Uh, we are expecting more, uh, but uh, we, we haven't had a meeting since getting that, but just wanted to share that uh, news that uh, it is concerning and uh, a lot of residents in the community as from seniors to students rely on that information and that interlibrary loans uh, for their uh, business, their schoolwork, and uh, their communication. So it's very disappointing. Thank you, Councillor. And I know that when our Conservation Authority uh, members get to their respective boards, they will uh, be discussing the 50% cut in the hazard funding to conservation authorities. And as a member of the Public Health Unit, I can talk about also the cuts that uh, Public Health have received. So certainly, um, certainly some belt tightening on, on the part of the province. I will say, however, uh, one of the big concerns is it's in-year cuts. So the province's year goes from April 1st to May 31st. Our year goes, ends December 31st. So our budgets are passed. And so any cuts that are made in-year are problematic because uh, we don't have the opportunity to, uh, to adjust those budgets at this time. So um, we'll... Leave it at that, but uh, and it's just a guess, but I'm suggesting there's probably more to come. So interesting times. Now we'll go on to the consent list and we'll start with the um, items on the consent list. So for anyone um, who's here or watching tonight, we're going to go through a list of reports that are in the regular council uh, agenda and available on the website. Uh, there's a staff recommendation, a proposed recommendation. If council agrees with that recommendation, uh, it, it'll, um, it'll pass. And if, if they don't, or if they have further questions or want further debate, we'll, they'll refer it to committee the whole and we'll have, we'll have discussion on that. So I'll start then with uh, items in A, which is the special council meeting uh, minutes dated April the 10th. Next is the regular council meeting minutes dated April the 10th. Next is reports of various committees. The first is a report from the Innisfil Beach Park Ad Hoc Committee. Summary report dated March 25. Next is the School Zone Traffic Safety Committee. Summary report dated March 26. Yes, Councillor. Yes, Your Worship. I'd like to defer that item to the next council meeting. 
uh, just that the, uh, the School and Traffic Safety Committee have done a great job, but the uh, minutes, I feel that uh, I'd just like to um, defer to allow additional um, recommendations that were made by the committee to be inclu included in the report to council for consideration. Thanks, Councillor. So we'll refer that to committee the whole, and then if you want to do your motion to defer at that time. Okay. Thank you. The next is Council's Discretionary Fund Application, uh, Nantar Shores School Leadership Awards Bursary. Everyone's okay with that? Good. D1 is a staff report regarding council expense allocation review, business expenses for council and for members appointed to committees policy update. Do we, Councillor Rossetti? Uh, can we refer, refer to, committee? to that one, please? Refer to committee. Item D2 is a staff report regarding wildland <laughs> firefighting agreement with the county Simcoe Forests. D3 is a memorandum of understanding for cost sharing for certain road improvements, Innisfil Beach Road in services in the County of Simcoe. And that's it. So E is other bylaws, 2019, the final tax rate bylaw. F is our correspondence for action. There's none. G, correspondence for information. Item G1 is the Office of the Solicitor General regarding animal welfare. Councillor Ices. I would like to refer that one to committee, please. Thank you, Councillor. Next is an item regarding C Bill C68, the federal <coughs> bill from uh, MP Cheryl Gallant. Next is correspondence from the Minister of Infrastructure regarding the one-time top-up of the gas tax fund. Great news for us. And G4 correspondence from New Tecumseh. And G5, uh, Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit Board meeting notes. Okay. Councillor Fowler? Um, I overlooked D3. Is it possible to have that put in committee the whole? The, Which item? The sorry? cost sharing of the Innocent Beach Pro. D3. Oh, okay. Okay, clerks, if you could, um, item D3 is referred to committee from Councillor Fowler. All right, so now we're back to H. Uh, there was no supplementary items, and so now we'll go to the consent list. So I had items B2, D1, D3, and G1. Okay. So did, do I have a mover for the recommendation on the floor? Councillor Nickel, Councillor Van Berkel, all those in favor? That's carried. and a motion to resolve to committee the whole. Moved by Councillor Fowler, Councillor Arsati, all those in favor, that's carried. We're now in committee of the whole and item D1 was deferred by, sorry, B2. Item B2 was deferred by Councillor Arsati, or referred by Councillor Arsati. Do you have a mover and a seconder for your deferral, Councillor? My seconder is Councillor uh, Bill Van Berkel. Okay. And that's a, a motion to defer to... And, and the motion is to defer this to the next council meeting um, to allow the report to have the additional recommendations that were made by the committee included in the report to council for consideration and possible debate. Okay. 
All those in favor of deferring this item? That's carried. Next item, D1. And that was Councillor Orsetti. My, my seconder on this one is, is Councillor Ken Fowler. He didn't even know what he was seconding for, so I had to give him a quick update. Okay, um, so uh, on this one, I just, um, one of the items that I, I wanted to just be able to discuss and how to handle this and a possible um, uh, recommendation or amendment is that in the first quarter, uh, members of council have attended some workshops without going through this procedure that you have to pre-put it on the council agenda to get council's vote uh, to attend. So um, not having known that, um, then I'm wondering uh, for an amendment if there could be that, yes, the, the clause would be that any member of council who attended an orientation or educational workshop in the first quarter of 2019 may submit a per diem claim for payment for that first quarter. Because as in the previous term for former councillors, you were holding those items for the end of your quarter and then you would submit them to clerk services. So it's even changed for us. But for new council, you may have attended a workshop, not submitted it in and not, all of us not knowing that the proper procedure is to have it put on the council agenda. So this would cover, um, you know, uh, that first quarter workshops. Thank you, Councillor. And uh, yeah, so the policy in the past was always to have council's approval, but it was a procedure that was never followed. It kind of fell off. Uh, so I think this is appropriate that uh, those who did uh, spend days at workshops uh, are compensated appropriately. And um, is there any other question or comment about that item or any of the report uh, that is that is on here um, that was in your council agenda tonight? Any of the report that um, includes the amended expense amount? Okay, seeing none, if you have any questions about the uh, ex expense report, the per diem report, or how it works, or how to submit it, please see the clerk's office and they'd be happy to help you walk through it. Mr. Parkin, did you have a comment? Well, just to, um, uh, if you want to approve the motion to have a mover and seconder for the amendment, sorry, and then to vote on the original. Okay, can I have a mover and a seconder on the amendment? Councillor Sadi and Councillor Fowler is on the amendment, and then the motion as amended, Councillor Orsatti and Councillor Fowler. All those in favor, that's carried. I know I should have done that twice, shouldn't I? Okay, all those in favor again. That's twice, there we go, done. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Clerk, for keeping us on the straight and narrow. All right, so the next item that was pulled was D3, and that is Councillor Fowler. You have a mover, a seconder for the motion, and then... I talked about the 20th and the ordinance will be to approve the entire intersection. Okay. It's going to be redesigned. Sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You have to... Oh, I'm moving. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, in this documentation, it doesn't significantly, in my opinion, address the intersection of Innisfil Beach Park and 20th Side Road, where it goes north of Innisfil Beach Road. Uh, if anyone who's driven that area recently understands, there's a disconnect or a break in the flow of traffic. Uh, there's the, tra there's the um, we have the railroad tracks, we have lights, we have two separate roads, people left, making left turns, right turns. No, it's, it's chaos when people try to go in it and rush our traffic. To do such a thing, like to, when we're responsible and it goes to the 20th side road, what's being done about that? I'd like some clarification because people are gonna ask, well, what are you doing with that particular intersection? Like, are you moving the road at all? Are you, are, are we taking over a piece of land? What are we doing in regards to that? Thank you for the question, Mr. McKenzie. Um, through you, you, your worship, to Councillor Fowler, 
Um, that's a separate contract with the county. They have three contracts. Um, one is the intersection of Young and IBR. Then there's the stretch between the two intersections. And then there's the intersection of IBR and the 20th and the tracks. That's all another contract. This is for just the span in between at this point. Okay, so um, I believe they're being held up um, with Metrolinks and getting the permits to do some of that work, but I know they've relocated the utilities. I'm not just sure on the timing of that construction, but I can get that for you, um, the phasing. I believe I sent it to, out to an email to council before, but um, the previous council. So, okay, all right, but I can get that for you, okay. Mr. McKenzie, would it be, I know it's a county project and not a town project, but would, I guess I should be asking myself this as a county councillor, would it be, would we be able to get a, a presentation from the county uh, on that particular intersection and how it's going to be, what will happen uh, after construction? Yeah, uh, through, or to you, your worship. Um, I can ask or we can present those details to you. Okay, I'll do, I'd be I'll happy ask the to have, it, okay. yeah, either or if, if we can't get someone from the county, I'm happy to have someone from the town maybe do at one of our meetings uh, a quick presentation because I know that particular intersection is, uh, is uh, of great interest to residents. Okay. Anything else, Councillor Fowler? All those in favor of the recommendation is printed. That's carried. The next item was item G1, and that is Councillor, did I miss one? G1, and that's Councillor Isis. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Deputy Davidson is seconding uh, my speaking to this part of the agenda. So as I uh, read the letter from the Solicitor General, um, I uh, was reminded that on, on our uh, dairy farm, we were uh, alerted uh, a little while ago about this court case that uh, the province was in regarding the uh, the OSPCA and their, the way their uh, organization is set up being unconstitutional. Um, they, they don't have oversight from the public and yet they had quite a bit of authority to investigate animal welfare issues. So they have been removed as the organization responsible for animal rights protection. Uh, as I read that letter, I, I'm wondering about the implications for our town. It seems that animal welfare protection would then fall on our police force. Um, I was looking for clarification on that. I was also wondering um, cost associated with that and maybe a little bit more, just more information on, on how that judgment affects our town. As a, uh, as a dairy pr uh, farmer, uh, milk producer, uh, our uh, producer groups are very aware of uh, treating our animals humanely. There are a lot of protocols in place to, uh, to protect the animals that we have on our farms. However, there are, there are always uh, a, a few exceptions where uh, animal welfare uh, needs to be uh, policed. So with that, I, I guess I'm, this is more of uh, a question about how this affects our, our town. So that's why I brought it forward. Thank you for that. Um, could I ask Mr. Vickers, and while you're preparing, I'll just 
uh, suggest that I did have the opportunity to meet with the Solicitor General, um, Minister Jones, on Thursday and speak about this. The, um, the, the province is appealing the decision, but regardless, they are um, working on more of a long-term solution. Right now, it's, uh, uh, it is uh, incumbent upon the police. Uh, we've expressed that that is a very expensive way to deal with the problem. We already pay the highest policing costs in Canada and to add animal husbandry to their, to their list of duties uh, not only would involve a whole bunch of training, uh, because I'm sure a lot of our uh, policemen and women uh, didn't grow up on a farm, but also as this rolls out uh, to include uh, pets in the, in, the, in the households too. Um, they've ensured us they are working on a long-term plan. I, I can't guess that it might not end up falling upon as an unfunded mandate to municipalities, but, but time will tell. And I'd ask uh, Mr. Vickers if he has anything he'd like to tell us. Am I on? Okay. Um, through you, Your Worship. Uh, we're walking into a vacuum, so we're all going to figure this out together. Our bylaw guys do a number of stuff with animals, as you know, but this is a whole realm of criminal activity, potentially, that's beyond our current training or, or realm of experience. So, I mean, we're used to picking up stray dogs and dealing with coyotes and, and working with the police force on a very you know, peripheral kind of uh, level relative to to farm animals. So, so we're gonna we're gonna figure it out, and it isn't really the dust hasn't settled. So, we'll keep working with it. Thank you, Mr. Vickers, Mr. I C or Councillor I C. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. The way I I understand it, however, like. The OSBCA is not acting in any form of animal rights protection. So if there was a complaint uh, from a resident about an animal they believed to be in distress, whether it be a pet or a farm animal, there is, is there a, a, a way for that? How, how would that be dealt with? That, that would be my question. So if the town, if the if we received a call, we'd go and investigate. Our bylaw guys would go and have a look within, to the degree that they would be able to enter a property and have a look lawfully. And then that we would be calling South Simcoe Police and, and working out together on, on, on what the resolution was. So our rights of entry vis-a-vis -vis those possible criminal activities might not be there. And so it would have to be on a call-by-call -call basis, and we'd have to be trying to figure it out whether it was us that could go in. Because we, we have made calls relative to dogs that are in distress and different things we've found, and you try and resolve it with the owners. Um, but the degree of offense that might occur it, to, may we all be beyond our capability, and we'd be phoning the police and, and working with them. Uh, so is is there currently uh, guidelines or rules in place that you can go to and say, okay, this this is an offense based on this, or are we just? It's well, it's, like so we're front line. A, Sometimes we're we're front line. We're the first guys there, and and we'll tr hopefully recognize this is beyond our abilities, and then and then pass that. Uh, situation on to those more equipped to handle it, but w so it's not uncommon that we get a front. You know, we we go to situations that are beyond our um, powers. That's that's not uncommon, but so we'll recognize that and and call who we need to call, and so that's that's the police force currently. Can I add that the province is telling us that they are going to come up with what you're asking for. They have uh, sent out a survey, a 34 page survey to every municipality in Ontario. Uh, 
so it is quite confusing. It's a little bit out of scope. It talks about, um, uh, you know, how what happens in Indigenous areas. It talks about um, the parts of the province that are not governed by municipalities. So it's a really hard survey to answer. Uh, it also, um, the, the numbers of calls that the OSPCA took over the years, uh, like traditionally, annually, are really quite large across the province. So, I mean, it is significant, uh, but at, at this point, um, it's just, I don't think, I think Mr. Vickers said it perfectly when he said we're walking into a vacuum and we're doing it together. Uh, we'll, we'll keep you posted. I know it's top of mind for the Solicitor General right now and also for um, AMO, which is doing some of the work about gathering statistics and the amount of money it would cost municipalities to take on this service. Thank you, Your Worship. J just because this is such a unique situation where, where the court found the OSPCA's powers unconstitutional. It's not like, well, we're phasing this in, so in the meantime, somebody's looking after this. In my understanding is there, there really isn't anybody looking after it. The police are, but I, I, I'm not sure what their, what rule book they're following, like all, all of that stuff I, I believe is not confirmed. Is that, is that correct? I would say so, yes. Thank you, and yeah, and so it, it is falling on the police at this moment, but uh, we have suggested that when it comes to farm animals, it should fall to the Ontario Ministry of, of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Affairs. We believe, we being AMO, believes that that's the proper place for the uh, agricultural portion of it, and, uh, and we'll see what happens with the, with the household pet portion of it. Councillor Payne. Thank you, Your Worship. I just have one question. I don't know who to ask. Um, for an example, if, if Kevin sees a coyote t attacking one of his cows and he has a hunting license, can he legally shoot the coyote without being reprimanded? Just a question. I, yeah, I would say yes. <laughs> I've never run, run into that situation, but. Any other questions? Thanks, Mr. Vickers, for taking one just on the fly there. See, oh, Councillor Assetti. Thank you, Your Worship. I think, uh, uh, thank you for the clarification, because when I had read the report, I, I was just reading the one from AMO as well, where it was um, dealing with the... Uh, livestock and horses, so I didn't realize that it involved all the household pets as well. So, yes, quite uh, worrisome. I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's June 1st that, uh, or sorry, April 1st, you're right, April 1st that it, that it uh, goes for everyone. We'll keep you posted. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of the recommendation? That's carried. Um, recommendation, rise recommendation, moved by Councillor Nichol, seconded by Councillor Van Berkel. All those in favor? That's carried. And uh, adoption of the recommendations that we discussed in Committee of the Whole. Moved by Councillor Fowler, seconded by De Deputy Mayor Davidson. All those in favor? That's carried. There's been no motions received this evening. Announcements. Does anyone have any announcements that they'd like to make tonight? Councillor Sadi? Just, um, uh, it's been a very uh, busy little time in our town and, and uh, surrounding areas with awards. Uh, I had the pleasure of attending John Broussard's Volunteer Awards, and uh, we had uh, Innisfil recipients in that. That was held, attended that with uh, Councillor uh, Peng, 
in uh, Barry. So we're going to, I understand the mayor is going to encourage him to uh, have the awards next year in Innisfil and maybe our library. But uh, it was well attended and nice to see the Innisfil residents uh, recognized. As well, um, I attended on behalf of the uh, mayor and deputy mayor the uh, 12, Simcoe County's uh, 12th Annual Public Safety Awards. And uh, that is uh, the awards given out to communication teams that was for uh, police, fire, EMS. And uh, again, uh, there was um, three uh, communication teams uh, that uh, were recognized for what they did for the uh, town of Innisville. One was with the, uh, their uh, quick uh, team effort. They were recognized for the, uh, the uh, school bus uh, accident that we had in Innisville, I believe, was last year. Uh, another one was a stabbing. Uh, then there was the uh, communication team on a stolen vehicle that resulted in 40 charges afterwards and had uh, gone on to uh, Bradford. Um, I was also very happy to see the number of residents that had attended the Townhouse uh, Square uh, opportunity at the uh, Lakeshore Library. It was very well attended, a lot of good feedback, and I think some residents misunderstood where the town square was, so it was good to have the opportunity to see those pictures and a lot of good ideas put forward. And then uh, Simcoe Child Care Services that put on an Easter extravaganza, even in the pouring rain, everybody showed up, they were packed, and uh, it's about businesses that go beyond just you know, celebrating their own, inviting everybody from the community. But they also had um, a company called Finding Them a Home, which was about rescue dogs that are from James Bay. And uh, it was hard to uh, see them and, and walk away and not take one home. But again, uh, you know, making it very, uh, yes, we want to bring some back and give some to some of the other counselors. But uh, uh, it was a pleasure to attend those. And I will give an update to clerk services. Thank you, Councillor Setti. Any other uh, announcements? Seeing none, uh, I would ask uh, staff if there's any announcements for the good of the municipality. I just re read one good news story about the new online payment for our uh, building permits and our uh, permit palooza, which starts on May the 15th. And uh, Mr. Rayner. Well, Your Worship, while we're talking about payments, then I just can't resist the opportunity to say that we have had our first payment in cryptocurrency uh, for taxes. That was uh, done yesterday. Woohoo! Thank you, Your Worship. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Rayner. Um, and I also would like to tell everybody uh, that if you'd like to uh, come out and support the Risardo Health and Wellness Center, there is a, a, a fundraiser Victorian tea put on by the Lioness Club, and it will be this Sunday between 11 and 2 at the uh, Lions Hall in Innisfil. Uh, Councillor Fowler. Um, just a quick reminder, I thought of it after the fact, I do apologize. Uh, this May 1st, we are having the uh, Innisfil World Maternal Mental Health Awareness Walk down in Innisfil Beach Park. Uh, it starts at 9.30, it's about an hour, and if you wait and you meet near the Innisfil Playground, uh, you'll see a lot of people come out. It's, it's a really good thing. It's, with mental health being thrust to the forefront of everybody's mind right now, I think this is something worth noting. Thank you, Councillor. So now we need a motion to receive confirming bylaw. Councillor Ices and Councillor Payne, all those in favor? That is carried and motion to adjourn. Councillor Nickel, <coughs> Councillor Deputy Mayor Davidson, all those in favor? Thank you, Council, and we'll uh, be back again uh, in two weeks. <laughs>